Hi guys, it's Debbie and after quite a long break, I'm bringing back my What I Watch This Month videos. January started off as what appeared to be a boring month and then quickly revealed some very interesting gems and I managed to cross off quite a few titles from my watch list. One film that had been sitting on my watch list for many years is Coherence and I'm so pleased I finally watched it. I loved it. Coherence is a film created on a very low budget in a pretty limited setting and mostly draws its beauty from its mind-blowing plot. Without spoilers, a group of friends get together for dinner but as the evening progresses more and more weird events occur and as they try to figure out what's going on their situation spirals out of control with a pacing that keeps you glued to the screen until the very end. When this film started I wasn't sure where I was heading as it looked like nothing surprising was going to happen but then with just one sentence everything changes and you're glued to the screen until the end. Another film I was curious about is Barbarian and I'm going to admit it. It was because it's a horror with Bill Skarsgård, you can't turn that offer down. In Barbarian a woman turns up at her house she booked on Airbnb only to find out that Bill is already staying there claiming he's also booked for the same dates. So you already have this very suspicious premise but then the film dives into an absolute nightmare when our protagonist discovers a um, creepy door in the basement and I'm not going to reveal what's behind it. On the one hand this film is absolutely terrifying, the director really knew where to put the camera to have us hiding behind cushions, some of those basement sequences left me petrified. On the other hand a lot of the plot development was very unrealistic, some of the choices the characters make would have no sense in real life and this made the film nearly comedic in some scenes. I would personally recommend watching this film with a group of friends to laugh and get scared together. But if we're talking about comedy and horror, how can we not talk about Megan? Um, now I kind of expected Megan to be more on the funnier side rather than scary, but I didn't expect it to have basically zero scary scenes. Maybe one in the dog scene. Megan is an incredibly realistic robot assigned to stay by kids' side, live with her while scientists collect data on her. But she quickly starts to step out of the boundary she was programmed to respect and basically becomes the evil robot doll. For me personally, this film wasn't a horror film. It was actually funnier in most scenes. And again, just as with Barbarian, I would recommend watching it with a group of friends. <laughs> The other horror film I watched this month is Necromantic, a film which made me seriously come to the conclusion that I should start to limit the amount of messed up content I watch, especially late at night, because I think that subconsciously, deep down, it does affect me. For example, this is a weird 80s German movie about a couple who enjoy doing it with the dead all in full detail and when I was staring at the screen of my computer dead-eyed at midnight I think I realized I might have to stay clean for a while. I didn't manage to commit to this right away and I followed this film by Favolace, uh, an Italian film which is so gut-wrenching that the narrator himself apologizes for how sad the story is. The premise of the film isn't that depressing, as a matter of fact you're kind of left wondering what all the buzz about it was, uh, as you're basically just introduced to different families living in the outskirts of Rome, often not in the best socio-economic conditions. But then it all gets darker and darker, ending with what is probably one of the most gut-wrenching scenes I've seen in years. So after this, I definitely needed some eye bleach. So for a few days, I only watched the most jolly, cheerful, brain-dead content. For example, I watched J.Lo's new comedy, Shotgun Wedding, which actually turned out to not be as bad as expected. The two protagonists don't have much depth. Do they get him married on a tropical island when their venue gets attacked by kidnappers, pirates asking for a ransom? But the funniest part of the film were all the guests who all have very different and peculiar personalities and react in different ways to the challenges that are thrown at them. Robert, Robert, they're calling you. Thanks a lot, Carol. The other comedy I watched to purge my soul was Mother's Day, in which the protagonists are all either dealing with their own motherhood or their relationship with their mother. For example, Jennifer Aniston divorced her husband and his new wife is becoming a new mother to her children. Two sisters have kept hidden from their mother who they've married because she wouldn't approve of them. There are orphans, people trying to reconnect with their biological mother. It's nothing special, it's just a light fun comedy. And the third comedy I watched right at the end of the month was You People, one of those Netflix originals that basically just scream Netflix original. In this film, Jonah Hill is dating a woman who comes from the most different background from him as possible, and they have to deal with their differences and most importantly, their respective families. For example, Eddie Murphy plays the overprotected and suspicious father who's always 
putting Jonah Hill's character to the test and Jonah Hill's mother is one of those white women who are basically trying to prove as much as possible that they're not racist, making it much worse. The premise of this film is funny but it's also nothing new. For example, I enjoyed much more films like The Big Sick. Also, most of the comedic scenes were set up in a pretty predictable manner. And I think the cherry on top of it all it was the forced editing uh, in the scene in which Jonah Hill has to play basketball. Speaking of Jonah Hill, I rewatched The Wolf of Wall Street, a film I have watched so many times which never fails to entertain me. It's the true story of Jordan Belfort who made millions in all the most scammy ways on Wall Street and enjoyed his money in the most wild ways. There's not much that I can say about this film that hasn't been said already Ready. It's really entertaining while also showing how money really is one of the worst drugs out there. I also watched a couple of documentaries this month. The first one is one you might have seen drifting around YouTube, What is a Woman by Matt Walsh, who is known online for his often very strong conservative takes. This documentary is interesting because he decides to meet the people who are at the opposite end of his on the spectrum of view, like doctors who perform gender confirmation surgery, um, gender studies, these professors and they attempt to discuss what is a woman in particular um, what people mean when they say they identify as a woman. I'm not a fan of Matt Walsh's but I wanted to see what would happen when these two extremes collided and as I expected often my views sat somewhere in the middle. The other documentary I watched is Jonestown, The Life and Death of People's Temple. The story of a group of people who from the 50s to the late 70s joined a crazy cult. They gave up all their personal belongings and savings. Uh, they left the country, they traveled to Guyana where they uh, settled there as a community and eventually committed mass suicide. Nearly a thousand people died including over 300 children. I've always been interested in this topic because I could never fathom how how so many people could collectively decide to give up their lives for this one guy and voluntarily die following his words. But listen to how the few survivors describe the events. This wasn't a mass suicide, it was murder. These people were first lured with false promises, they were easy praise, they found their community but ended up being literally physically trapped in it and forced to literally drink the Kool-Aid, that's where the term originates from. I definitely recommend reading about this topic because it really proves how somebody's words can affect a lot of people, something which in the era of internet people often underestimate. I'm also curious about the upcoming film about this story in which theoretically Leonardo DiCaprio should play the crazed leader of the cult, Jim Jones. A happier movie I watched this month is Smiley Face, a film I would have probably skipped over if Carson Runquist hadn't spoken so well about it. It isn't my type of film but it after all, it is pretty funny and entertaining. It's a story of a woman who accidentally gets really, really high and has to try to run all her errands and meetings and even a big audition all while she's tripping and of course it creates a lot of fun situations. I then watched The Almond and the Seahorse, the story of two couples in both in which there is a person who is suffering severe memory loss due to brain trauma. As I fortunately never had a direct experience with a situation of this type, I underestimated how difficult the situation is for both parties involved, how frustrating everything can become for people who suffer with these conditions and how helpless and lonely their loved ones feel. All that being said, this film doesn't really dig that deep into the topic and I also felt there was a dramatic difference in the acting skills between the two couples, especially between Charlotte Gainsbourg and Rebel Wilson. Another tough depiction of relationships is after love, the beautiful and sad story of a woman who suffers the loss of her husband. But while going through his belongings after his death, she discovers a big secret she never knew was going on just a few miles away in France. To give you some context, the film takes place in Dover in England, which is very close to France. It's just a short ferry trip away. So our protagonist sets off to find out what was going on over there, and I won't tell it to not spoil the film, but I will tell you that it's a very deep analysis of love in a manner which is rarely depicted on screen or talked about in real life. I then watched Our Little Sister by Hirokazu Koreda, who is well known for his um, 
depictions of families, let's put it like that. For example, he directed Shoplifters about a family who basically kidnaps a kid from an abusive family with the mindset that they are helping that kid. Or Like Father Like Son about two families from very different backgrounds who discovered their kids were swapped at birth. Or Broker about people trafficking babies left given up for adoption. So he always covers these different aspects of family life. And this um, film of his that I watched, Our Little Sister, in my opinion is much quieter as it's basically just an observation of the life of three sisters who after many years meet their younger half sister. There are no huge plot twists or a thrilling storyline proving you can make a great story even out of the most common daily life moments. Then what did I watch? Ah yes, I watched, uh, actually re-watched Under Suspicion, a film I had completely forgotten I'd seen before until halfway into it, I was thinking, you know what, this looks familiar. In this film, Morgan Freeman is investigating a brutal murder in Puerto Rico, and the main suspect is a wealthy and well-known resident, somebody who you never point your finger at. And most of the story takes place inside the police station, is basically an interrogation of the suspect and those close to him, slowly reconstructing all the facts and uncovering even more about his life. I'm definitely not planning on re-watching this anytime soon, but it's not that bad of a story, it's pretty gripping, it keeps you wondering until the end and forming your opinion on the suspect as the plot progresses. I then watched The Upside, uh, which if I'm not mistaken is the remake of a French film, is the story of the relationship between an incredibly wealthy man and his new carer. In this American version, the two are portrayed by Brian Cranston and Kevin Hart, and their work relationship becomes friendship, and many interesting topics are covered as the two come from completely different backgrounds and end up helping each other out. I pretty much enjoyed this film. I have not seen the original one, but I've heard it has some great reviews, even much higher than this remake. I also watched Brick, one of Ryan Johnson's first films years before Knives Out or Star Wars. Now either my brain is slowly rotting away, but I really struggled to keep up with this film. Basically it all starts with a phone call a guy receives from his ex-girlfriend in which she is clearly in distress for some reason and this leads him to investigating more and more about it and uncovering all sorts of weird things from high school drug dealers to murders but for some reason I just couldn't manage to keep track of everything. Please let me know if you experienced something similar. But in any case you can definitely see how this style of filmmaking evolved years later into well put together murder mysteries like Knives Out. I then continued on my quest for completion of Wong Kar Wai's filmography and I watched Days of Being Wild. If Hirokazu Koreda does families, Wong Kar Wai does couples. He's famous for films like In the Mood for Love, Happy Together, Chunking Express, Fallen Angels, all about very intense relationships in many different ways. In Days of Being Wild, the protagonist keeps on moving from one girl to another while dealing with his awkward relationship with his mother and one of the women he leaves brokenhearted ends up searching for a love of her own complicated in the story. As usual, Wong Kar Wai just mesmerized me with the storytelling and the cinematography and aesthetic that drew me to his works years ago, and I just can never recommend him enough. I then watched Deepwater Horizon, a film which I had oddly been wanting to watch for quite a long time. It's the true story of one of the worst ecological disasters of all time, a huge oil drilling rig that exploded due to a combination of many factors that could have been avoided and ended up spilling a disastrous amount of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. This film stars Mark Wahlberg, so obviously Marky Mark had to try to be uh, the exaggerated hero wanting to save the day and save everybody, but I was more interested in seeing a full reconstruction of how all the events happened. I think that's about it for the month. Ah, uh, I watched only one short film this month at Rain Town, a Japanese anime by Hiroyazu Ishida, who is the director of Penguin Highway. In Rain Town, a kid walks around a rainy town where everything is wet and damp and where it just rains all the time non-stop. And she explores this town with a peculiar figure she encounters on the way. I've been watching many of these anime shorts recently because every time you get a taste of uh, different styles, different narrations, and I love how they manage to create a really engaging and interesting storyline in just a few minutes. But with that, we have reached the end of today's list. Of course, I would love to hear what you watched this month as well as what you thought about the titles I mentioned today. So make sure to leave a comment down below below. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe, give it a big thumbs up, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!